Next slide. And gender issues, please. Um, go to the next. Um, Colonel Sharma has explained to you the background why um, we have a protection of civilian mandates. He's told you about the IDPs um, and people who were returning, the armed groups, etc. cetera. Um, the particularity of destabilization in, um, in the Congo affected Eastern DRC the most. In the sense that in 1994, there was the Rwandan genocide. And there was a humanitarian corridor that was opened in the DRC, um, imposed by the international community for people who were fleeing the genocide from Rwanda. And this has had a lasting impact, impacted women and children men and boys in various ways. Colonel Sharma has told you that um, the second uh, peacekeeping mission from the UN to the Congo was in 1999. But when that peacekeeping mission was opened, there was no gender section. This was in 1999, there was no gender section. The women were addressing gender issues on their own piecemeal, trying to get into the peace talks, etc. When the gender ministry was, when the gender unit was opened, it was in 2002. By that time, Resolution 1325-2000 had been passed, and our mandate was linked to Resolution 1325, which, please, Yes, there. which required that there should be gender mainstreaming in all the priority operations of MONUSCO. You know, uh, be it in the work of the military, be it in the prevention and response to sexual and gender-based violence, be it in the return of the rule of law, be it in the political participation of women, governance issues, the resolution required that there should be a gender perspective integrated into all these operations. Um, they talked of IDP camps, there had to be gender issues included in uh, the administration of the IDP camps. What happened to the women and their children what happened to tracking families, all of these were gender issues that had to be addressed in the IDP camps involving the returnees and um, military people being repatriated. Next slide, please. That picture is a picture of the DSRSG rule of law and the gender office is under her direct supervision. The experience that we have had in the field is that the more we have women on board, especially in the higher ranks of the organization, the more effective and sustainable our efforts have been. Next slide. The evolution of gender issues in the, in, the, in, in, the, in MONUSCO has been dictated by various United Nations Security Council resolutions. In 1999 to 2002, we can categorize them in three categories. From 1999 to 2002, I have spoken to you about Resolution 1325, which was the watershed resolution that brought the gender office into being. Aside from that, in 2002, there was Resolution 14, 
33, for which talk about developing the capacity of women in peacekeeping. Resolution 1565. Can you, it's so small I can't read. Can you increase the font, please? Okay. All right, so. Security Council Resolution 1433-2003, which talked about um, increasing the participation of women in peace building and 1565, which, talks, which uh, talks about prohibition of sexual exploitation. Um, and this is, was another watershed because the Gender Office lobbied for this and the Security Council passed this resolution and the Conduct and Discipline section was created to monitor the behavior of United Nations personnel on the ground. And you know that at that time there was the zero tolerance that was passed, that any um, United Nations staff that was in, uh, involved in sexual exploitation, you know, was withdrawn from the field and was prosecuted uh, in their own country. Uh, this is something which is of particular relevance to the Latin American countries that provide peacekeeping troops because you want to monitor the behavior on the ground of the troops that you send, you know, to help, to assist on gender issues. And therefore, when these troops are sent back, those who, um, uh, you know, who, who may have committed you know, crimes of sexual abuse. When they come back to your countries, you should follow up on what they have done, if they were guilty, and if they were guilty, you must punish them to act as a deterrent. And so this resolution was an important resolution in the evolution of gender issues in Monuc. The next resolution was 1820 and 1888. These are all the sister resolutions to resolution 1325. And I want to insist that this resolution should not be looked at as separate resolutions on their own. They should be looked at as complementing resolution 1325 on women, peace, and security. We call them sometimes the sister resolutions to 1325. And this talked about the prohibition, the, you know, the pro prohibition of sexual violence in conflict and uh, the prosecution of perpetrators of sexual violence in conflict and supporting the victims of sexual, viol sexual and gender-based violence in conflict. I would not dwell on this because my colleague Marie uh, would go in depth on that topic. But this again shows you the evolution of gender issues in MONUSCO and why the sexual violence unit was created, you know, to address the specific issue of gender issues in uh, of sexual violence in conflict. My section also has a role to play in terms of sexual, sexual and gender-based violence in conflict. It addresses all forms of sexual and gender-based violence in conflict and post-conflict. We do analysis to find out what are the trends, how to respond to them, and with which partners. We also support victims we make sure that they receive support from those who are specialized. We support NGOs who are working on sexual and gender-based violence. And 
We also make sure that they are aware of all the regulations. We distribute the UN resolutions which prohibit sexual and gender-based violence. Make sure that all parties to the conflict, the government, the armed groups, the women's association are aware of the regulations that are passed by the, by the Security Council on this matter, which underscores zero tolerance and prosecution for those who perpetrate these crimes in conflict and post-conflict zones. We look at how these crimes affect women and how to respond to the way that they affect women, boys or girls and men. We find out that girls are, you know, violated sexually. Boys, young boys are grafted into the army, very young. And all of this affects their development. And so we look for ways of responding to this. The Gender Affairs Office was also part of uh, the working group that studied the matter and made MONUSCO to take to Security Council a resolution which said that there must be conditionalities for supporting the FRDC army in that they should not be involved in sexual and gender-based violence and that they should not have children in the army. If those two conditions were not fulfilled, then the MONUSCO would not provide support, you know, uh, to the work of the army. And so we have held their foot to the fire for this, and this is being perpetually monitored. And then um, from there, you, we have Resolution 1960, which talks about um, the monitoring and analysis of sexual violence in conflict. Uh, again, uh, this monitoring has brought about the fact that women protection advisors should, should be part of the mission. But uh, there is um, a, a resource problem because we are still struggling in the gender office uh, to recruit a woman protection advisor. We do not have the funds and there is a zero ceiling uh, of uh, placed on the organization in terms of staff growth, which means that if we have to have these women protection advisors, we have to have them from supplementary funding that is from other governments that are able to provide uh, such support. And this is where um, I see an opportunity for a conference like this because uh, there are lots of potentials here from bilateral and multilateral corporations and from um, the Latin American countries themselves. If you're thinking of sending uh, people to help us in the field with our work, then we are in need of women protection advisors. You have seen the scope of Congo. We are not able to be present everywhere because of lack of human and financial resources. And uh, therefore, any supplementary assistance that we can have in terms of um, human resources and financial resources to address this issue and beef up our presence everywhere is something that would like to look at and which would encourage our administration um, to support negotiations with whoever is able to assist us in, in this matter. Um, so you have seen the, please. You have seen the gender mandate of the mission. It is a big mandate. It is not something that one office can do on their own. And so our role, we see ourselves as catalysts, you know, training our colleagues in the substantive section, having them to have a point gender focal points, you know, who would help in mainstreaming gender in the work that they do in their, in their sections, helping them with the development of manuals on gender training, not only for our staff, but also for the military and for the police. 
and uh, we deal extensively with others outside of the mission, the civil society, the government, bilateral and multilateral corporations. You know, making sure that we build partnerships, you know, um, to address gender issues in peace building. Next slide. We help to build the capacity of the DRC security forces, the army and the police on gender issues. Um, next slide. We have had a few results, difficult to come by, but nevertheless, we have managed. Um, in terms of reconfiguration and stabilization, we have, like I said, contributed to the training of the police and the armed forces in gender, in gender mainstreaming issues. On protection issues, we have made sure that women are more involved in the mechanisms for protection. We have trained our colleagues in the joint protection teams, and we have participated, participated in community alert networks. We have worked with community liaison officers, and we have tried, you know, to coordinate um, escort for mobile clinics of hospitals. We have undertaken research. In 2010, we undertook research on the impact of, in, uh, of, um, of um, um, informal uh, mining for women and girls in the DRC, and the results were very devastating. Girls go to the mines at the age of seven, Boys, similarly, they fall out, drop out of school. They are sexually exploited. They are trafficked. They live under very unhealthy situations. And even babies are taken by their mothers to the mines. It impairs their growth. These are all problems which have to be addressed in terms of the protection of, of, of women and girls in the Congo. We need police who are specialized in protection issues, you know, and who would support the government in uh, uh, monitoring protection issues around the mining areas. We did this study over 11 or seven provinces, and these are the problems which exist, which must be taken into consideration when we talk about protection. And so the monitoring involves a lot of forces. It involves the government first, it involves the military, the police, it involves um, civil society organizations that are specialized in protection issues, it involves the UN agencies and humanitarian organizations. And we try to work with all these people. The next slide. So, in terms of partnership building, uh, we have worked with the government to develop uh, the 1325 National Action Plan, um, which looks at all facets of women's inclusion in 1325 implementation. We have also tried to help them to mobilize funding for this. We have worked with UN women in, within the ambits of this 1325 development, you know, and so uh, we are still in the initial phase of seeking funds to implement the resolution. And this is another entry point for cooperation with those who are interested. We have also, um, like I said, done a lot in the area of training and development of manuals. And uh, we recently undertook um, training on gender and elections issues. And this was with the funding of the Luxembourg government. Um, we also tried to mobilize the women in, that, in the area 
of prevention of electoral violence. I think that it is um, a matter of pride that the women in the Great Lakes region were the first to think about mechanisms, regional mechanisms for avoiding electoral violence with the support of MONUSCO, with the support of the Luxembourg government, and also with the support of civil society organizations throughout the Great Lakes region, comprising of Rwanda, of Burundi, of the DRC, and Uganda. And there is a declaration that came out of that um, workshop that we organized in Goma, which shows that if, a, if, a, if a, a, an observatory for elections is created by the Great Lakes uh, Regional Organization, it will help in preventing um, it, in, it will help in preventing security um, and a violation of security issues. And so um, that also is another entry point for cooperation uh, because I see that people have a lot of experience on regional defense and security issues. And also the challenges, I think they have been brought out very clearly. Uh, even in the first presentation, the scope of the country, the lack of infrastructure, which also affects the mainstreaming of gender issues right down to the grassroots, um, especially for those who are affected directly, the poor, women and girls, men and boys. Also, there is a challenge in terms of application of the laws. Congo has, DRC has in its constitution that gender parity should prevail in uh, occupation of public functions. But in practice, this is not so because there is no enabling law that has been passed to make this happen. The electoral law also has a deficiency in that it does not respect the gender parity that um, has been uh, passed in the constitution. And the effort to get an amendment of Article 13 of the electoral law, which does not consider gender parity, was thrown out of parliament. The result is that women are not well represented either in parliament or in government about 8% in parliament, less than 10% in government. And uh, Madame Rumbu will tell you exactly what the situation of women is there right now in terms of representation in decision making, in public decision making. And this is a big challenge, you know, um, for us in terms of effective political participation of women in peace building processes. The next slide. DPKO has done a lot in terms of supporting our gender mainstreaming with our input. Um, we have gender and military issues that are mainstream, how to mainstream gender issues in the military, how to mainstream gender issues in political affairs, how to mainstream gender issues in UN poll, how to mainstream gender issues in disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration of ex-combatants, you know, and the work of the gender office is to make sure that all of these are operationalized in the field with the help of gender focal points from each section and with the help of civil society actors and the government. The UN Security Council 1325 has also laid out um, the parameters for measuring progress on gender issues. And there are prevention, participation, protection, relief, and recovery assistance. And these are the parameters that helped us to develop the National Action Plan, which is now itemized as I talked to you about it before. There are other things that have been developed 
by the Secretary General. This is very new, and that is um, the Secretary General seven point plan on gender sensitive peace building. And the DRC is one of the countries that has um, self nominated itself to be a pilot in the implementation of the Secretary General seven point plan. And the, since it's seven points, we cannot possibly apply all of them. We can only work with within available resources. And so the DRC has said that it will work through the mission, has said that it will work on women's participation in conflict resolution. It will work on women's participation in governance, which is one of the issues which I have said is a challenge. It will work on Re, the re-establishment of the rule of law, uh, including combating impunity, and if possible, it will work on relief and assistance issues. Next slide, please. So, you see the operational targets and progress indicators, you know, the major responsibilities of the gender issues, of the gender um, office within the ministry within MONUSCO, supports attenuating conflict, reducing all forms of sexual and gender-based violence in, post, in conflict and post-conflict situations. Make sure that there's inclusion of women and women's interest in all decision-making processes with regard to peace building. Enhance women's safety, physical and mental health consolidating security and respect for human rights, meeting specific needs of women in conflict and post-conflict situations. Next slide. And all of these we try to apply in all that we do in terms of partnership building. Next slide, please. And you can see about how much uh, we, we need to do in partnership building. The SRSJ is, of course, the head of mission, and he is the main responsible person for gender issues, even if uh, we are under the supervision of the DSRSG rule of law. And so the, we support activities of the SRSG in mainstreaming gender issues with the government, in working with the Ministry of Gender, Family, and Children, and also in collaborating with civil society and NGOs. In the mission, we have to mainstream gender issues, like I told you, in all the substantive work of the mission, DDR, security sector development, the military, civil affairs, human rights, child protection, sexual violence, uh, conduct and discipline, um, we also collaborate with the administration, which supports us logistically in making sure that we are able to operate in the field. And also we work with the rule of law section and political affairs, UN pool corrections unit. We also collaborate with the DSRSG, uh, who is in charge of the UN agencies and who is in charge of the integrated office. And so it is a, a real web you know, and requiring a lot, a lot of work with partners within and outside the mission. I think, um, I hope that I have given you a full picture of what it is that the gender office does and how it does it. And I have one example of, you know, the cross-cutting collaboration that we do. And so if they can put up the slides, please. The next slide on the pictures, yes. The case on cross-cutting collaboration on gender issues. And if I can start talking to you about it, um, it is about on the area of relief and recovery. And in this relief and recovery, we try to make sure that we validate women's work we have, as a gender office, initiated the women's fair in the DRC. 
This women's fair in the DRC is not only a fair to expose what women do, but also creates a forum of exchange with the government, with um, the bilateral and multilateral corporations that exist in the DRC, with civil society partners, and also with the rural women who, without this forum, would not have a chance of coming to town or would not have a chance of discussing issues relating to gender. And so this is one of our examples of how we try to bring those who are relegated in the very remote areas of the DRC, how we try to bring their issues and concerns to the mainstream of development efforts. Um, this um, women's fair, although it was initiated by the gender office, now incorporates all of the UN agencies who support it uh, financially and logistically with us. And the military are involved. Can you go to the first picture, please? The very first one. That is the Ghanaian battalion on the opening of the fair, and it was uh, from the 5th to the 15th of March this year. Go back to the first picture, please. And they were there, you know, um, for the opening. The Ghanaian battalion had also helped us to put in place 76 tents where the women could expose their merchandise, their books, whatever it was, because we discussed every single thing under the sun concerning women in this fair. The next slide. The next picture. Next picture, please. That is the Minister of Gender who is receiving the acting Prime Minister because this fair is uh, done with the collaboration of the Ministry of Gender and in the premises of the Ministry of Gender. And so that was also in the, in the opening of the fair. The next picture. Next picture, you can see a, a cross-section of the crowd that was there. You know, women from all kinds of organization. We had 220 NGOs participating in this fair. And at, at the end of the fair, we had received at least 15,000 people who had visited the fair, which is an increase from last year where we had about 10,000. The next picture. Next picture. And you can see the rural women there. We support these rural women logistically to bring their products to the fair, you know, to expose them to sell. But more importantly, we give them opportunity to at attend conferences. We had con about 76 conferences organized on health, on education, on um, protection, women in peace building issues, protection, that we had our people from the field to come and talk to them about how women can participate in protection mechanisms. The next slide, please. This woman is from Goma. We made sure that we brought women from the provinces to come and attend the fair so that they can go back and also organize their own fair. This is part of what we call capacity building for the local people. And I think that this is a big entry point because this time we also called embassies to come and talk to them about what opportunities exist, you know, in their countries for women, and how can this also be transferred to women in, in the DRC. And so this also gave opportunity for us to bring women from the provinces, and administration helped us through MONUSCO flights to bring these women from all over to Kinshasa. The next slide. Um, that is DSRSG Lela Seruki looking at the MONUSCO stand at the fair. And every single United Nations agency had a stand in this fair explaining what they do, how they do it, and with who, so that the common person can understand and relate to what it is that the UN system does in the field. The next. This is one of the conferences 
and we had women from civil society organizations to come and lecture in the conferences on their specialties. There were doctors that came, there were political leaders that came, you know, there were women involved in all kinds of things that came to address the women on how they could integrate themselves in gender and development issues. The next slide. The next, the next, uh, we also talked about electoral issues. You know that they had just, there has just been an election in Congo and where Mr. Kabila was re-elected. And we, the gender office did do some work, as I told you, on women and elections. We even did a monitoring of security issues pertaining to women's participation in the elections. We also discussed that once again in the fair so that women can participate better in provincial and local elections which are supposed to come sometime in 2013 and sometime later on this year. The next. That is the Bangladeshi police force made of 60 women. And this is the novelty that we have in that for the first time we have a police force that is made only of women, 60 of them, and they provided security for the fair. So you can see how we work together in mainstreaming gender issues, even in terms of building of partnerships and assistance, relief assistance to women. I thank you. <laughs>